Hello and welcome to another one day build. But before I even get into it, I'm gonna go ahead and thank my sponsor, which is China. They've been gracious enough to supply me with all these parts very cheaply, but in a not timely manner. I've been accumulating parts for a solid two months now, maybe more. And I think we have everything we need now, but I didn't take into account brakes. So we don't have those. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm gonna address that issue or not. So yeah, we'll just jump right into explaining the process and how this is gonna work. Yep, smell everything. Yep, that's good. So there's two goals with this project. First of which is to stay low budget. And by low budget, I mean stay under $250. And right now what we have in front of you is $216 and change. And yes, you can buy a running mini bike for under $250, but that's not the point. The second goal is to prove that you can build a mini bike with just parts that are lying around. And then, you know, you have something that you built, you can be proud of and it works. So to start off, the frame is a 72 Fox mini bike frame and it had a two and a half horse Briggs on it originally. I paid $60 for the frame and engine combo, which was too much, but I didn't know better, so whatever. And the engine was shot, and I'll show a clip of that shortly. The engine I picked is a three and a half horse Briggs that came out of a snubbler. The reason I went with that is because that engine was $20, and then it cost $27 to reseal it, which I will also show how to do that shortly. The reason I picked a snowblower engine is because they're usually set up to run ungoverned, and they're usually set up to run full throttle and also under load. So that should be stout enough for our purposes. And again, it's three and a half horse, so it's not gonna be quick. So I think it'll be fine that it has no brakes because it's not gonna go fast. The carb intake and air filter assembly were just taken off of a Tecumseh lawnmower, which was actually a six horse, I believe. So it's over carbed right now. So you may have to figure out a way to rejet that so it doesn't run rich. The throttle cable and kill switch are just leftovers from the PW80 as what is the new chain. And then we have grips and a clutch and axles and stuff like that. That all came from, you know, online. So really there's not a whole lot to this. It should be really easy. Yeah, just walk through the frame. That's just, yeah, keep doing that. The first step is to strip the frame down and then we're gonna clear coat the frame just to do patina sort of thing. So to start off, I'll just show you the clip of trying to start the engine. And it turns out one of the compression rings had actually fallen out of the groove of the piston and was like overlapped itself. That's uh, like 50 PSI. I don't know how well it's coming up on camera, but. I can probably measure that gap, that's so bad. So yeah, there was no saving that engine. The cylinder wall resembled more of like a record or maybe a ruffles chip. Like I could catch my fingernail along the grooves. And aside from that, it looked like there was either dirt or metal or a rock or something that had been floating around in the combustion chamber for a long time because everything was chewed up in there. So yeah, we'll just do a quick time lapse of the engine reseal process. Obviously the engine's used, but it'll continue to run and it was running before I had messed with it. Okay, so I got everything taken apart, picked out the parts that I'm gonna clean up. All I'm gonna do now is just take a putty knife, wire brush, all that, get all the caked on crud off. And then once I'm happy with that, we'll do a couple passes of Scotch-Brite just to get all the surface dirt and crud off. And then we'll do a couple coats of clear. Okay, so I got it all cleaned up. 
It took a lot longer than I thought. For the frame, we're just gonna use clear wheel paint just because it's what I have lying around and it should be pretty durable. For some of the other bits, we're just gonna use black caliper paint because again, it's what I have lying around. Okay, so I've got everything laid out and I started doing some mock-up and ran into some issues so I had to go out and buy more stuff. Firstly, the paint's all cured now and it orange peeled really badly. So what I did is on the larger areas where you can see the orange peel very clearly. So this fender, the engine mount, and like the triangulation panels of the frame, I cut and buffed them so that it just wet sanded and then compounded. And even with that, like you can still see the orange peel. So yeah, there's like a texture to it. So that was my fault for you know using what I had, but it's in theme with the budget build, so I'm not worried about it. A couple things I have left over I just want to show you. So this is a switch to a PW80, so I'll end up using a leftover PW80 thumb throttle. And all these parts I had bought when I was building the PW8, I bought like the miscellaneous assortments of hardware and stuff, and these were in them and I didn't need them. Other things that I noticed that I need to deal with is the wheels I bought are 5 8 bore bearings. The frame has holes for 3 8 bore, so I have to adapt 3 8 to 5 8 So I got these 3 8 ID to 5 8 OD spacers. And what happens is, so the bulk goes through like that and fits nicely, and then the wheel sits as it should, but the only problem is both the fork and rear frame assembly are a little bit too wide for the tires, so the tires can pivot back and forth on a fixed axis, which is super sketchy and also will throw the chain on the rear if I leave it like that. So what I now have to do is I got 5 8 to, I think these are 3 quarter spacers, and those slide over that like, like there. And what I'll end up doing is I'm going to have to measure everything and trim all the spacers down to what I need. And then once I have them at the size I need, what I'll end up doing is JB welding these two together and then capping it off with a washer. That way we have these like custom adapters and we don't have a bunch of things that are loose so like let's say if I don't glue it that someone takes it apart later and it all falls apart and they have no idea how it goes back together so I'd rather just make the adapters now and get it over with and the reason I'm not welding this which is welding is the right thing to do is one because I don't have a welder and two because in the theme of this being a budget like DIY build some people don't have access to welders but everybody can have access to an $8 container of JB Weld. That's why we're sticking with that. So I'm gonna just go ahead and start slapping stuff on the frame and also put the frame back together. And then we'll get working on mounting the engine and locating it. Another thing I did, but didn't really mention was any hardware that was questionable, I went ahead and replaced and I tried to keep everything SAE, which so far everything is SAE. That way if there's someone who's working on this in the future, even if they only have like a very limited toolkit, they'll be able to work on this. It's not an uncommon thing for stuff that kids own. Like over time, the hardware that gets used on it's just whatever they have lying around. So stuff ends up being really random. So for example, the engine that was here previously, two of the bolts matched and two of them were just random and none of them were really the right size and none of them had any way to really retain them. They were just like a nut and bolt. There was no lock washers, no locking nuts, no lock tight. There was nothing really keeping it together aside from like just torquing it down really well. All of that is taken into consideration when I'm working on this. It's not really necessary, but I'd rather just like keep it as simple as possible for the, the next person. The other reasoning behind using nylon nuts for everything was a lot of the stuff has to move. So like this has to pivot, this has to be able to pivot. And if I just use a regular nut and bolt, I can't really tighten it down all the way while also allowing this to continue to move. So the nylon nuts are pretty good at that. I'm not really sure how I'm gonna mount this just yet. And then throttle and then grip. I think that's good. I think that's, yeah, I'm fine with that. Quinda quality. So if you see what I mean about the needing spacers on top of the spacers, the wheel can do that. So what the end goal is, 
This needs to be glued to that, which needs to be capped off by that. So that will be the end result for a spacer. In order to clamp these all together to make them tight, I'm going to run it all together like this, and then tighten it all down, and then just let it cure all the mating surfaces, like this side of the washer, the inside of this collar, the outside of the other collar. It's all been sanded. That way there's a lot of bite material for the JB Weld. So the spacers turned out pretty well. This is a pretty simple system. That way if anyone has to take this apart in the future, there's not really any question as to how these things go together. They literally just sit in there like that. So just a matter of slapping it back together, bolting it up, and then we can move on to the back, doing the same thing, and then just aligning it. It's such a pain to get all these shims all lined up. We're going to start off with both the engine all the way back and the wheel all the way forward and then measure for chain. That way we have the maximum amount of adjustability. Next step is wire up the kill switch, but that should be really easy. The air filter doesn't fit because the fender's in the way. And the other thing I noticed is the gas tank's outlet is below the inlet of the carb and I can't really change that on the carb. The only thing I can really do is move the tank. And since this is a gravity feed system, we need the tank above the carb. I'm gonna just take this off real quick and we'll see if we can move it around. Otherwise I gotta like order a tank or find some other tank to use. So a couple of issues I think I've found solutions for. Firstly, the gas tank needs to sit up higher. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut down one of these spacers. This is the same one they use for the wheels. So it's a three eighths to five eighths. I'm gonna cut this in half, which will give us about a, I don't know, three quarter inch rise. The last issue that I wanna address Carb, as I mentioned, is from a six and a half horse Tecumseh. So technically it's over carb for this engine. So this engine will probably run rich. The other thing though is I need to run a filter and I can't really do that as it sits. So I may flip this intake over and put the carb up higher, which would make the fueling issue now an issue again, even with the spacers. So I'm not sure about that. The other thing is I still have the spare PW80 carb and I'm not opposed to cutting up another lawnmower intake and mounting the Makumi up here somewhere. The only reason I don't want to do that is technically this engine's 128 cc and it's that carbs for an 80 cc two-stroke which would probably be okay but I don't know jetting may be required. The other thing is is this build is supposed to be a budget build and looking at used PW80 Makumi carbs they're like 70 bucks or more for a used one. So I don't really think that qualifies as a budget build because I don't think people just have those lying around. I got a few things done off camera. First of which is I got the wiring done. The ground is mounted up under the seat and the other wire just goes to the coil and both these wires have fiber loom on them and are heat shrinked. I have it matched up properly with the switch so when it's on the run position we have spark and when it's on the off position we don't have spark. So let's see, we're on the run position so if I pull this we should have spark. Okay. Yep. And then off spark. So that's good. I got the clutch mocked in place. I just wanted to verify that the sprocket on the clutch and sprocket on the rear wheel will line up and it's super close. I would say maybe an eighth of an inch off. So I got some section of plumbing pipe. It's just a little three inch section and a little coupler and that'll put that right about there which is good. The other thing that I chose to address while I was at the hardware store was I got a little piece of quarter inch PEX, which is just like plumbing, plastic tubing. And I'm gonna use that to vent the crankcase down and away from flammable things. And originally, the reason this is here at all was originally this engine had that the old style square gas tank with the carburetor that would pull up through the gas tank into it, like via a diaphragm. So that was an old junkie system. So we got rid of all that entirely, which leaves this vent just hanging out here. Okay, internet, what do you think? That or that. That's still cheating though. Like this isn't a budget build anymore. You know what? I think I'm just gonna go ahead and mount the mower carb upside down, like with the intake upside down. That way it sits up high and I can run it with a filter and thus not destroy this engine right away. And then if y'all think the dirt bike carb would be better, then we'll switch to that. As long as y'all can come to an agreement that the dirt bike carb doesn't make this not a budget build. All right, so this is how it's gonna stay for now. It's not really ideal just because once the fuel level gets below the highest level of the carb, 
it's not going to feed anymore. So basically, when the tank gets to half full, it's going to run out of fuel more than likely. But this is more or less for testing purposes because I need to know if this carb is even going to work with this engine. It looks like the engine and rear sprocket are really close. So I probably don't have to move it. Um, other than that, this is hitting the engine plate. It's also not tensioned. So if that's an issue, then we can either space the engine up a little bit or just notch the engine plate. I'm probably gonna get judged pretty hard for this, but the problem is this clutch is not actually installed on the crank because the crankshaft snout is only like an inch long. So right now, there's no way to mount this clutch. It's just hanging out here. I could probably put a bolt through here, but there's no Woodruff key that's holding this clutch in place. So it would more than likely just spin on the clutch and scar it up pretty bad. So my solution to that is I ordered this keyway shaft, which is three quarter inch with a 3 16 keyway cut into it already. And this is exactly what the crankshaft is. So that needs to go in there and that'll give us a Woodruff key and also the ability for a set screw. The other thing that is a problem now is one, this needs to be cut down precisely to that size and two needs to be drilled precisely for the 3 8 bolt to go through this through the clutch and into the crank. The reason I'm not doing that yet is because this needs to be like absolutely precise and I don't think I'm capable of doing that. So I think machine shop is the proper way to go with this and we have one locally so got the chain cut and installed and it is tensioned and it's not touching the engine mount which is great. I got some you know the gold hot boy heat tape stuff that like NASA uses to sort of protect the intake. I wanna try to help it out as much as I can. So we got a bit wrapped around the fuel bowl and then a little bit on the filter, which this is probably just gonna melt, which is whatever. And then I only put on the fender just to try to protect the paint a little bit because things are literally just gonna be blowing at the fender. I also ordered this cabling kit, which comes with two different sizes of cables for exterior housings and also interior cables and then all the little fittings and stuff. Well, this is looks like almost no work, but it was actually a lot of work. So I had to trim up the cable, mess with it a lot to get it to work because it was too long and it didn't really work and didn't go the directions I needed it to and so on. I couldn't get the throttle cable through this linkage without it binding on the housing of the carb itself. I had this little 90 degree bend bracket and even then I had to trim this bolt to be shorter and also trim the housing underneath here to clear the nut on the underside. I'm really actually proud with how this turned out. So obviously the cable is all done. All we have to do now is mount a return spring, mount this little breather hose somewhere, and then finish the clutch mounting and then we're done. I'm like, I'm super excited to get this thing done because I want to ride it. And it's supposed to snow in the next couple days. So we may even be able to ride around the snow and die. So that'd be pretty neat. I got the throttle return spring thing figured out. I drilled and tapped both this stud and this one back here, just to accept a bolt. I wasn't sure which one I was gonna use, so I just tapped both threads into both. I used the back one, which required trimming down the one cooling fin back here. And it works pretty well. Sometimes it doesn't do anything. Sometimes it doesn't return. So it just adds to the sketchiness. The other thing I figured out, this spring initially had like a eight inch section of spare wire, just so that way you can adapt it and you have extra material to work with. But what I did, I trimmed off that extra little bit of wire and I used it down here. I mean, it's not tight, but it's secure enough that it'll be fine. Well, that was a waste of time. I ended up cutting out probably a hundred pull starts that didn't even try to start. And I left the ones that were like sputtered or attempted to. And I've come to the conclusion that this carp is trash. I sort of rebuilt it. By that I mean I just cleaned it and resealed it. But as it turns out, one, it still leaks. And two, it floods the engine pretty quickly. So this carb's not going to do it for us. And also on top of that, a new carb is $8. So when I was looking for carbs, I tried to find one that was four, like five horsepower and under. And this one's supposedly four between three and five horse. That should be a better fit for the engine versus the one that's for a six and a half horse. And on top of that, I tried to pick one that had a choke that was adjustable and also a fuel inlet that wasn't at a weird angle like the old one was. I now have to redo all the linkage setup because I wasted all my time making this one and now I can't use it. The issue I'm having is the throttle cable doesn't like to make a 90 and the little piece of metal that is the 90 that helps it do that is 
flexible, so that keeps moving. So what the plan here is now is I got this just generic linkage, and I want to try to. It's supposed to sit in place of the factory one, but this that's going to be a pain to mount without a welder. So what I'm going to try is I'm probably going to cut this and remove have just this long extension and put it on the pivot point. That way we can pull it much closer to where the cable housing is. That way there's no bend in the cable. Okay, so I think it's a pretty good result. Everything seems to be in place. This the choke works as it should. The throttle works as it should. The only remaining issue now is the thumb throttle likes to stick. My right hand is using the thumb throttle. Here's my right hand, and it stayed there. So the thumb throttle likes to stick. So I think maybe I'm going to take it apart and grease it, and see if there's a way to remedy that because that's a little sketchy, especially considering we don't have brakes. So now it's just a matter of putting fuel in it and starting it up. Aside from it not wanting to run at anything other than idle, which is just a carb tuning issue, this gas cap leaks, so I'm gonna have to swap that. And then once it cools down a little bit, I'll change the oil in it. But other than that, we seem to be in good order. Like the throttle works, the choke works, the fuel height thing is seems to be a non-issue now. So once the crank adapter comes in, we should be good to ride it. Just kidding, I thought I had gas caps that fit, but I don't, so that's whatever. That went in pretty clear, and now it's coming out metallic and gray. <laughs> Considering how bad that came out, this was fresh oil when it went in, and it's only run for maybe three minutes. I'm gonna go ahead and put in at least one more sacrificial oil change to see if I can help flush it out as best I can, even though I've already cleaned it while having the engine apart. There's obviously stuff still floating around in there that needs to be removed. Because, wow, that is quite metallic-y. I've spent a about 40 minutes or so doing testing and tweaking on the carb, as well as it's on its third oil change right now, including the one I just showed you. The crankshaft, I don't know when that adapter is gonna come in, so I'm gonna end up calling it here as far as an episode. So I'll start it back up, I'll show you it runs and revs and all that, and then we will cut it here, because I mean, at this point, we're waiting on stuff and I don't wanna hold up this episode any longer than it already has been held up. Okay, so that's it, and I'm pretty happy with the end result. There's still little things that need to be tweaked and adjusted and whatnot, and obviously the crankshaft adapter is still a missing thing that may take who knows how long to get back. And in an effort to not delay this episode any longer, I'm just gonna go ahead and call it here, and then we'll do it like a writing video once it's back. But yeah, I mean, it's built, it's done. The total budget ended up being $263 and some change. So we're a little over my budget, but that's okay. Like, I think the result's good. And I'm not really worried about, you know, going over by $13. But yeah, that'll be it for this one day build, or rather one episode build. But yeah, with all that being said, thanks for watching and stay tuned.